Welcome to the first of our Gold Dream series for this semester, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Netta Klavner from Birkbeck College, part of the University of London, to speak. Uh, Netta is currently in the first year of her PhD. Um, some of you may be interested in talking to her afterwards about her experiences of uh, doing graduate work over here. But I'm sure you'll be particularly interested in what she's going to be talking about tonight. This fits in with some aspects of her PhD research, which deals with issues of kingship, um, the use of urban space and monumental art. She's also interested in various aspects to do with national identity and the formation of memory. Of course, for our purposes as well, she's very kindly talking about something that will link in with our first field trip um, in the British Studies course on Friday. Um, which I'm sure this is why you're all here. Anyway, her title tonight, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming her, uh, is The West Front of Lincoln Cathedral and the Gallery of Kings, an Imagery of Ideal Kingship. Thank you, David, and thank you all for coming. Um, all right. Uh, today, Lincoln Cathedral... Does that work? Uh huh. Okay. Today, Lincoln Cathedral's west front is a many-layered structure, structure, an amalgamation of different architectural and sculptural styles, ranging from the first Norman building to the Gothic additions of the 13th and 14th centuries. For much of the Middle Ages, the west front provided the main entrance to the cathedral, and as such, it stood as the face of the cathedral's fabric. <coughs> The West Front changed little since the 14th century, giving us a good idea of what a medieval visitor would have experienced when facing the church upon entering. The medieval church was designed and built as a simulation of the heavenly kingdom. The building, along with its decoration, provided people a constant reminder of faith, and furthermore transmitted in a tangible way the theology and the sacred beliefs of the church. A close association between medieval church architecture and the theological understanding of the heavenly kingdom has been the subject of many critical studies on medieval architecture. With tall walls, jewel-like stained glass, and large portals, the cathedral materialized St. John's vision of the heavenly city as depicted in the Revelation. Along, alongside the architectural symbolism, the sculptural programs of the medieval church exterior were usually designed to complement this conception by exhibiting apocalyptic narratives and imageries, as well as the inhabitants of the celestial kingdom. In France, this usually includes elaborate displays of sculpture along the tympana, which is the enclosed arch above the doorway. As for example, at the Mien Cathedral, where the Last Judgment and the Coronation of the Virgin appear alongside biblical narratives and large-scale figures of saints, prophets, and apostles. Another example can be seen at Chart Cathedral with the coronation of the Virgin in the central doorway. And we can see how the sculpture really spreads around the entire, the entire doorway, but still concentrated on each portal. In England, the church facade takes on quite a different form, with sculpture spread across the entirety of the cathedral rather than concentrated along, around the doorway. The most famous example for an English facade is the west front of Wells Cathedral, where a display of hundreds of figures is spread across the entirety of the facade, overshadowing the biblical scenes that become marginal. The life-size statues include both secular and religious figures, with the figure of Christ at the apex of the, of the front and the 12 apostles standing below him. I will talk more about the iconography of the sculpture later, but for now I just want to get a sense of how the English church used sculpture on its church, on its exterior walls. Although it does not follow the French sculptural scheme, the subject remains the same, exhibiting figures that represent the heavenly, the heavenly kingdom with the scene of the coronation of the Virgin above the central doorway. We'll return to that later. Though today mostly a modern reproduction, the west front of both Southbury Cathedral and Litchfield Cathedral provide us another example with, again, life-size figures scattered across the facade. Lincoln went, Lincoln's West Front, however, brings a contrasting view, a huge display of architectural decoration where sculpture appears only in isolation, 
Embedded in the massive stretch of blind arcades is the Gallery of Kings located above the central doorway. Just, just above eye level and at the very, the very center of the facade, the Gallery of Kings is an inescapable element of the structure. But despite that, it does not seem to comply with the conception of the church as an image of the heavenly kingdom. Facing the west front of Lincoln Cathedral, the usual religious iconography is discarded in favor of a Gallery of Kings, a striking image of monarchic power. When approaching Lincoln Cathedral's west front, the viewer is confronted by an image that seemingly has little to do with Christian belief. Indeed, the succession of kings can even, even be seen as a secular subject. Looking more closely at the iconography of the king figures and placing them in the wider context of cathedral sculpture, my hope today is to show how the Gallery of Kings demonstrates the medieval sacred conception of kingship, and moreover, to show how the royal figures adhere to a much earlier medieval tradition of depicting royal figures on cathedral exteriors, and specifically the West Front. In the second part of the paper, I will demonstrate how the royal figures provide a visual expression of medieval social ideals and 14th century historical circumstances. And I will additionally consider how the gallery might have functioned during liturgical ceremonies. Before discussing the Gallery of Kings, I want to dedicate a few minutes for a quick breakdown of the different construction phases and earlier sculpture of the facade. The first stage of building began in, in 1072 by Bishop Remigius. The only surviving structure of the 11th century fabric is the central portion of the west front, the arch, which is a construction of ma massive buttresses and three deeply set doorways. The church was dedicated to the Virgin Mary and built in a variant style of Norman Romanesque, with prominent features of military architecture. The defensive design, as, such as the hour slits, hint at the dual purpose of the, wind, of the building as a place of worship as well as a defensive structure. These openings can be seen here in the reconstruction drawing of the original Norman front. Des describing Remigius' foundation of the minster, Henry of Huntington wrote in, 12, in the 12th century that he, talking, speaking of Remigius, constructed a strong church in that strong place, a beautiful church in that beautiful place, dedicated to the Virgin of Virgin, it was to be both agreeable to the servants of God and also, as suited the time, invincible to enemies. Remigius was the first, no first Norman bishop to be appointed in England, a position he got through his personal relationship with William the Conqueror and as a re reward for his aid during the conquest. When designing his cathedral, it is possible that Remigius intentionally chose features that echoed the nearby castle, built some years earlier by William I, Not much of the ca castle remains today, but enough of it to sort of get a sense. By positioning his cathedral adjacent to the castle and through the use of architecture, Remigius declared his affiliation and support of King William. Besides having features that are perhaps more suitable for a castle, the Norman facade also relates to the monumental Roman architecture, specifically the triumphal arch. The use of a triumphal arch-like structure can be seen as a sign of Norman victory celebrating military triumph under William the Conqueror, comparable to the well-known arch of Constantine in Rome. Additionally, in a reappropriation of the symbolism of the triumphal arch, Lincoln's Norman facade celebrates the triumph of the church and of Christian rule. The dual function of the structure as depicted by Henry of Huntington is reflected in its design. In the 12th century, the facade was remodeled by Bishop Alexander during which it, which it is generally believed the carved panels, the carved doorway colonnettes, and the decorative arcading above the recesses are added, were added. Um, I sort of tried to we put like a, a, a wash of purple on there so you can sort of get a sense of what was added. The frieze, the strip of sculptural, sculpted panels, is today mostly replicas with the originals displayed in the morning chapel inside the cathedral. The panel consists of figural narr narrative subjects that depict scenes from the Old and the New Testament, all of which were brightly colored. It is possible that portions of the frieze were stripped away from the Gothic, from when, the Gothic window, when the Gothic windows were inserted and when the Gallery of Kings was installed. It is further believed that the sculptural program was a much larger one and that the wall expanses of the recesses were not left empty. Just to go back there, um, I think I'm talking about is right about 
right above the doorways, which many scholars would, would argue these remains were placed. Fragments of the sculpture, fragments of sculpture were found nearby the cathedral and are believed to have been part of the 12th century design and to have been located above the doorways of the cathedral in a fashion resembling the French sculptural programs, where the arched area above the doorway is filled with religious images. The fragments seem to be part of a sculpted relief of Christ in majesty and of the tree of Jesse, a popular and meaningful image in church, in church sculpture, which I will discuss later on. In the 13th century, under Bishop Cossetesta, the walls of the West Front were expanded, forming an arcaded wall that stretched to the sides of the Norman remains and to the top of it. This structural curtain is aptly called a screen facade, a popular design for church facades in England, as we just saw with Wales, Salisbury, and Lichfield. But while statues occupy the niches of these church cathedrals, Lincoln's endless arcades remain empty. But to be fair, <laughs> some, did ar some have argued that the top gable was meant to include sculpture or either has included sculpture that later on was lost. So it, it's not really clear whether there was something there or it was just left vacant. But it wouldn't, I mean, the design would imply that something was meant to be up there on the, on the gable. But we don't know that. In the second half of the 14th century, the Gallery of Kings was installed above the central doorway. The gallery is comprised of 11 royal figures below richly ornamented canopies, nine facing front and one more on each side facing each other. The exact dating of the gallery is inconclusive, some claiming they were produced in the 1360s and others asserting they were created later in the 1380s or even 90s. The patron of the gallery is unknown and it is unlikely to have been a royal commission. The king figures are all dressed in the style of the second half of the 14th century. Some of the figures are sitting in a cross-legged posture, and each figure is positioned in a unique pose which retains a sense of mobility. Most scholars identify the royal, the royal figures as the historical kings of England, from William the Conqueror to Edward III, the reigning king at the time of the gallery's construction, thereby providing a solid explanation for the number of figures which otherwise bears no significance. But the identification of the king figures is not as straightforward as that, since first of all, the figures do not bear inscriptions or attributes that determine their identity. And secondly, their subject of regal succession is a common motif for medieval church facades, and one that goes back to mid 12th century France. Royal figures frequently appeared in one form or another on the facades of French cathedrals and churches. When Abbot Suget rebuilt the Abbey of Saint Denis, his political agenda to affiliate the church with the French monarchy was clearly brought forth in the sculpture of his West Front. Though lost today, illustrations attest to the existence of large-scale crowned figures, which were presumably distributed on the doorway columns of the Abbey, Abbey's portal in a similar manner to what we can see today on the west facade of Chartres Cathedral, also known as the Royal Portal. At Chart, the royal figures include both kings and queens. There are several theories relating to their exact purpose and identity. While most agree that the figures were undoubtedly meant as portrayals of Old Testament royal figures, including the ancestry of Christ, none were able to label the figures as individuals. Furthermore, several scholars have maintained that the figures were actually meant as a representation of the royal succession, and others still attempted to view them as prophets and saints. Later galleries of kings, such as those at Amiens, Reims, and Notre Dame in Paris, similarly baffled art historians. These cycles of kings, unlike the column statues at Chard, are comprised of all male figures and visually have more in common with our gallery of kings at Lincoln. The royal figures are placed in gabled niches of, above the doorway of the West Front, though here on a much higher level, and in, and in a continuous cycle of uniformly crowned kings. This is the Gallery of Kings at Amiens Cathedral, but what I really want to talk about is actually the Gallery of Kings at Notre Dame Paris, which is today a modern replacement to the medieval statues which were beheaded during the French Revolution, of which some heads were later found and displayed in a nearby gallery. If ever, anyone is ever there and wants to see some of the heads, 
<laughs> regarding, <laughs> regarding this royal cycle, some scholars claim that the royal figures exhibit kings, the kings of France, while others have adamantly argued that the figures are a display of the tree of Jesse, a widely popular motif in medieval art. Writing in the early stage of this discussion, Emile Mal claimed that the figures decidedly represent the tree of Jesse. However, he also asserted that confusing their identity as the authentic kings of France was a common misidentification that occurred even in the 13th century, though he does add, undoubtedly, a mistake made by peasants. This so-called misidentification of the figures by their medieval viewer indicates the way in which they were perceived, whether meant to display the tree of Jesse or not, they were still most likely commonly associated with the actual kings of France. Such royal representations are not unique to France. They commonly appear in the French facades of, in England as well, though in a somewhat different manner. Some of the figures have been identified as Anglo-Saxon, Norman, and Plantagenet kings, some through inscriptions. Other figures can be recognized through their garments and attributes as ecclesiastic, patriarchs, prophets, saints, and others more as unidentified kings and queens. Pamela Tudor Craig has recognized Wells' sculptural program as a manifestation of St. Augustine's vision of God's city, wherein the righteous believers dwell alongside God. The structure of the West Front can thereby be seen as a take on St. Augustine's conception that God's temple is built of souls, not stones, and is the house of God's elect. This assembly of life-size royal and sacred figures pivot upon the central axis dominated by the image of Christ in majesty, who appears in the top gable. In this ranked order of heaven, the royal figures have a clear meaning. They are displayed as celestial beings that serve as buttresses and mediators to the heavenly church, where Christ sits at the apex. But an additional corresponding meaning emerges when reading the facade in relation to the scene of the coronation of the Virgin. Located above the central doorway, the image of the coronation, in addition to its use as a metaphor for the heavenly kingdom, is also interpreted as an allegorical image of the church triumphant. In this symbolic representation, the Virgin Mary acts as a personification of the church, and her crown, crowning signifies its triumphal and eternal reign. As such, the west front of Wales, of Wales not only visualizes the heavenly kingdom, but additionally, through the image of, the, of Christ in glory and the symbolic image of the coronation, signifies Christ's, Christ's eternal rule and the earthly triumph of Christianity. Um, it's a bit damaged, the coronation of the Virgin at Wells, so I brought just for a comparison one from Chart Cathedral. It would have looked something like that, just maybe just slightly different in style. Following the design of the west front of Wells, in the 14th century, a screen-like extension was added to the west front of Exeter Cathedral. Constructed some 20 to 40 years prior to the Gallery of Kings at Lincoln, Exeter exhibits a truncated scheme of the heavenly kingdom in an interpretation quite similar to that of Wells. It is believed by some that the original design of Wells' Wells screen facade also included above the central gable a scene of the coronation portraying a symbolic image of the triumphant church. At Exeter, we once again have a large-scale large scale regal figures alongside knights and ecclesiastics, together comprising the celestial order, all originally colored. Here, the sculptural program is divided into three tiers of figures, enclosed in gable niches. Only the two bottom rows are dated to the 14th century, while the upper row is a later addition. The bottom row consists of, a bust of, of busts of angels and the second of kings and knights. But lacking ex in ins inscriptions or attributes, we face the same problem when trying to identify the king figures as we have in the earlier French galleries of kings. The identification of Exeter's royal figures has also been prone to controversy with some arguing the figures a representation of the kings of England, and others claiming them a display of the sacred kings of the church, the kings of Judah. The confusing purpose of these figures, like that of their French precursors, can once again be seen as an intentional one, portraying a familiar image of kingship that can be perceived as a representation of the king, and at the same time, transmit a more complex and symbolic meaning, that is, the ruler's spiritual descent from the Davidic dynasty.
Lawrence Stone suggested in his study on the English medieval sculpture that the Gallery of Kings at Lincoln was modeled after the screen facade of Exeter Cathedral. Exhibiting a row of seated figures in niches under ornamented canopies, the king figures at Lincoln certainly demonstrate a stylistic similarity to those at Exeter. More importantly, they demonstrate the common iconography of authoritative power, the cross-legged posture and the clasping of the mantle cord. But there are a couple of, this, of, of significant differences between the two. Firstly, at Exeter, the royal figures appear as part of a larger constellation, with additional figures and perhaps the coronation of the Virgin. At Lincoln, the row of kings appeared detached from a grander sculptural theme. And secondly, while at Exeter there is no reason to believe that any of the figures held the regalia, at Lincoln some figures still hold in their hand the remaining orb from the Globus Cruciger, and are believed to have held a scepter as well, or alternatively a sword, thereby signifying their authoritative power as well as their sacred identity. Um, not sure if you're able to make out the orb, but they're sort of holding it nonchalantly, like just laid over their, their knee. This pattern of depiction created a visual analogy between Lincoln's king figures and the image of Christ in majesty, Christ as the ruler of the world, often depicted holding the orb in the, orb in the same manner. Excuse me. In the portrait of Richard II from the 1390s, this pattern was again practiced, and for the obvious reason of glorifying and sanctifying the monarch. Depicting a succession, depicting a succession of kings, Lincoln's Gallery of Kings also takes part in the debate over the identification of the figures as either the sacred ancestry or royal dynasty. In fact, Lincoln's Gallery of Kings has more in common with depictions of the Tree of Jesse than what might be initially recognized, as I intend to demonstrate. The appearance of the devotional theme of the Tree of Jesse as a subject for monumental art is generally believed to have originated in 12th century France, with its two earliest example as, examples at Saint Denis and Chard Cathedral. These windows provided the fundamental elements of the depiction of the Tree of Jesse, which were later incorporated in numerous churches, including Can Canterbury Cathedral. The iconography of the Tree of Jesse is derived from the prophecy of Isaiah, which tells that a rod will sprout from the stem of Jesse and a branch will flower out of his roots, prophesizing Christ's descent from the Davidic lineage through Mary. The tree of Jesse illustrates just that. In this iconography, the sacred genealogy of Christ is quite literally represented in the form of a family tree, or rather an inver inverted version of the modern family tree. At the bottom, we see the recumbent figure of Jesse, from which descends the sacred genealogy from David to the Virgin Mary and to Christ at the top. In England, representations of the Jesse tree became excessively popular in the, in the 14th century, with numerous examples appearing in stained glass all over the country. Unfortunately, most of them are, are known only from fragments. The royal figures in the tree of Jesse appear at times standing, as seen here in the 14th century window at Wells Cathedral, but more frequently, they appear in, seated, in a seated position, similar to the gallery, to the earlier stained glass series in France and Canterbury, as well as this 14th century window at Ludlow. Crowned and enthroned, this, the resemblance between Lincoln's Gallery of Kings and the image of the, of the Old Testament kings is pretty clear. Additionally, as I, as I mentioned before, there's a good possibility that a depiction of the Tree of Jesse was, ex, was exhibited on the earlier West Front. If indeed this was the subject of the West Front sculpture, the Gallery of Kings now on display alludes to the previous design, taking into consideration the location, style, and iconography of the Gallery of Kings. It may be argued that they too bear a, an intentionally ambiguous appearance, and by, ref, and by referencing the imagery of the Tree of Jesse, declare the sanctity of the English monarchy as the spiritual successors of the sacred genealogy of Christ. In the Middle Ages, the idea of the king as a divine ruler was well established throughout the kingdoms of Europe. And in the 14th century, this conception played an important part in the battle between England and France, the Hundred Years' War. French kings have especially been known to be avid advocates of, the, of royal sanctity, heavily propagating their sacred roots, 
The French kingdom identified itself as God's favored realm, and the French king as a Christ-like figure. When Edward III declared himself the true heir to the French throne, his struggle was not only to prove his ancestral rights, but to prove himself God's chosen king. While the premise of Edward's claim was his hereditary right, as the last living heir of King Philip IV, his claim was, was largely propagated through the use of vocabulary and imagery that portrayed the king as God's anointed ruler. In, in 1340, Edward revealed his new royal arms, a shield depicting the French fleur-de-lis quartered with the English leopards, seen here on the Brittany seal from 1360. For the French king, the royal fleur-de-lis signified dynastic rights and regal power. But more than that, the fleur-de-lis symbolized the sanctity of the French kingdom and the superiority of the French as God's chosen people. By adopting the French symbol as his own, Edward, in addition to proclaiming himself the rightful heir to the Capetian dynasty and the true king of France, also advertised God's blessing, God's blessing of his claim, at least when viewed by French subjects. Aside from the use of the quartered, the quartered shields the, and elaborate architecture, what really stands out in this seal is the presence of God in a small niche above Edward's head. And when I mean stand out, I mean as a subject, because I think you can actually barely make it out. But I have it from good sources. That. <laughs> His pose, especially the way the orb is, orb is held, mimics that of the king, or rather vice versa. No doubt this parallel between the king and God was intended to convey the king's rule on earth as absolute and eternal as that of God's in heaven, as well as positioning Edward as God's chosen king. Nope, sorry. I mentioned earlier the dress of the figures, and I believe this is an important aspect of the sculpture, since it connects the statues to contemporary representations of, of Edward III. The king figures are carefully designed to portray the fashion trends of the second half of the 14th century, as seen also on the seal of Edward III. Most of the kings wear a jupon, a short and closely fit garment, usually fitted over a corset or chest padding that gives the figures their, hour, their hourglass shape. The similarity between Lincoln's king figures and the image of Edward III on the seal is distinct, and for those who saw one and the other, an association was obvious. Another interesting comparison between Lincoln statues and the image of Edward III is the, figures on the is the figure on the left buttress of the portal. Interestingly, this is the only figure in armor. The style, again, is that of the second half of the 14th century, with the spodler and the vambrace that resemble quite a lot the armor worn by Edward III and his son, sons in what used to be the mural of St. Stephen's Chapel at Westminster. In the early 1350s, Edward III ordered the renovation of the, the St. Stephen Chapel at Westminster, during which the, chapel's, the chapel walls were decorated with murals, most of which were destroyed by the fire in the 19th century. For what can be reconstructed, the murals offered a theatrical depiction of the royal family, presenting a processional display of its members. The mural has a distinct military articulation. Edward and his sons are portrayed fully armored, and their surcoats emblazoned with the politically charged quartered arms of England. Additionally, King Edward is presented to the Virgin and child by St. George, the warrior saint that, that fights on behalf of the Virgin Mary. The juxtaposition of Edward III and St. George, both positioned below the image of the Virgin and child, implies that like St. George, Edward operates on, as, as a sacred knight of the Virgin Mary. Clad in armor, the male members of the royal family are seen as pious warriors sponsored by God to defend the Christian church, equated by contemporary propaganda, propaganda to the English kingdom. The mural thus illuminates the status Edward III had acquired after his victory over the French in the military campaign of 1346 and 7 as a divinely inspired instrument of English salvation. Furthermore, the king's right to bear the French royal lilies is declared here a sacred privilege and one that is passed on to Edward's successors. Through its, armored, uh, armored, through its armored figure, the gallery of kings relates to the idea of the king as a warrior, as seen, on the, on the, as seen in the mural of St. Stephen, and brings into context Edward III's war with France, portraying the king 
a sacred warrior defending the kingdom in a war that is very, that at its very core stood the question of ancestral right and divine authority. Uh, the, the figure in armor is to come at the far left. While the St. Stephen mural declared, clearly promotes the war with France through its heretic, her, heraldic display, the Gallery of Kings does so by exhibiting the retrospective royal lineage beginning with William the Conqueror, the very king who had created the intricate relationship between the French and the English royal families. The Gallery of Kings displays a coherent royal lineage, unbroken and divinely sponsored, it, exhibits to it, it exhibited to its medieval viewer an ideal image of kingship that the French king could not have claimed and pronounced Edward III the third superiority in the line of succession. The French successional royal dynasty was broken the moment Philip of House Valois assumed the throne. Being the nephew of King Philip IV, Philip VI was not in the direct line of succession, which Edward III was through his mother. The English royal dynasty, as opposed to the French, remained seemingly uninterrupted from the first Norman king, aside from some battles between cousins and perhaps even regicide. But all of that just sort of swept under the rug for this purpose. Though Edward III's, ma sorry, yes? Though Edward III's maternal, maternal hereditary right was the supposed reason for his claim to the French throne, in England, especially during the, le the later years of his reign, Edward's patrimonial claim became a targeted subject, especially during the 1360s, the time of the gallery's construction. Through the location of the gallery above the remaining arch of the Norman structure and facing the castle built by William the Conqueror, the Gallery of Kings establishes a strong and continuous royal presence that legitimizes Edward III's war with France, but also signifies a strong and continuous royal presence specifically at Lincoln reminding the medieval society that they are under the king's authority as much as God's. The royal figures provide a replacement for Christ. In the layering of symbolism, the gallery of kings is placed above a triumphal arch-like structure in the, in, the, in the place of God and at the center of, of a structural metaphor of the heavenly kingdom, in addition to evoking the imagery of, the, of, the, of Christ's sacred lineage. Just take a drink of water if you don't mind. The king, as a stand-in for Christ, would have been strongly felt during liturgical processions, which would involve an elaborate ceremony that were processed through the streets of Lincoln, around the cathedral, and passed through the West Front before, before it culminated at the altar. The structure of the West Front played a substantial role in the medieval processional liturgy, providing the designated entrance into the cathedral and functioning as a backdrop to the religious ceremony. The grandest religious procession was that of Palm Sunday, for which the 13th century West Front was often tailored to function in a performative role, as for example, a Salisbury, Litchfield, Exeter, and of course, Wells. On that day, the, the front of the church became a stage for the reenactment of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. The structure of the West Front includes hidden alcoves in which a choir would be situated and seen through cone-shaped -like cone -shaped holes concealed in the wall that served as megaphones and created the illusion that chanting was emerging from the stone sculpture. The sculpture of the facade provided a sacred procession that reflected the earthly one and essentially united the inhabitants of the heavenly kingdom with the earthly faithful in prayer and celebration of Christ's triumph triumphal entry into Jerusalem, here symbolized by the structure of the cathedral. While at Wells and other churches of its kind, the king figures are part of a celestial order. At Lincoln, the king figures are extracted from a larger sculptural scheme and viewed as a single composition. When, process, when processions advanced towards the west front of Lincoln Cathedral, the attending public would virtually confront, con confront the divine monarchy while, while reciting psalms and hymns aimed to glorify Christ. The words in many of these prayers frequently incorporated an ambiguous meaning, as they could also be understood as referring to the reigning king. 
For example, a Palm Sunday hymn includes the words, Behold the King cometh unto thee. Hail our salvation, our true peace. Another example is the processional chant presumably sung by the choir at the central doorway of the church. All glory, laud, and honor to the redeeming king, to which the procession would actively <coughs> sing in, in response, Thou art the king of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name cometh, the king and blessed one. It's very rhyming. At Lincoln Cathedral, Lincoln Cathedral, hymns of this sort would have been chanted as the procession approached the gallery of kings making the royal figures rather than Christ the object of adoration. The gallery thereby promoted the political ideals of the 14th century kingship, recognizing the king as a divine entity and celebrating his triumphant rule as the victory of the church. Medieval processions at Lincoln would often include a procession around the exterior of the cathedral, moving clockwise towards the west front. On the way to the south, on the way to the south of the cathedral, the judgment porch would have been seen and its imagery contemplated by the viewer. Just before the viewer would encounter the west facade sculpture. The sculpture on the south entrance portrays the last judgment. In the center of the composition, the figure of Christ is seated in a quatrefoil supported by angels below him we see the jaws of hell prepared to take in the sinners dragged down, on, <coughs> dragged down from Christ's left. From Christ's right, the righteous are carried up to heaven. The composition is a curious one, but I will not go into detail about that just now, but rather concentrate on one aspect of the sculpture. That is the seated royal figures and the tree of Jesse depicted in the arches that surround the image of, of the last judgment. This thing has a oh, it does. So I'm looking at specifically this, and then this. In the outer arch of the of the right side are eight male figures standing in in entwined vine branches, making them, marking them as the ancestors of Christ, forming a tree of Jesse similar to that we've seen in Canterbury, but lacking the figure of the recumbent Jesse. On the inner arch are on one side kings and on the other queens. So these figures are all kings and right here we have the queen figures. Like the other imageries of royal figures we encounter today, it is not clear whether they are meant to portray saints or, or the royal dynasty. The king figures, like, like the much later gallery of kings on the west facade, are enthroned and mimic the posture of Christ. Seated between the tree of Jesse and the image of Christ, the king figures are clearly meant to relate to both. They are the succession of the Davidic royal dynasty and they are the kings who rule as God's earthly replacements. The judgment porch was constructed a century or so before the gallery of kings on the west front and belonged to a completely different sculptural program. But nonetheless, a visual illusion is clear. Proceeding to the West Front, this imagery of regal power and judicial authority continues to resonate. And when combined with the chants that celebrate the Messiah's descent from the Davidic lineage, the multiple layers of symbolism in the Gallery of Kings resolve into a single message, the role of the king as God's replacement on earth. Contrary to other royal representations we looked at today, such as the facade of the French and English churches, the mural of St. Stephen Chapel, and even the great seal of Edward III, the king figures at Lincoln are not part of a larger com composition. Therefore, in the gallery of kings, the promotion of the king as a divinely chosen ruler is amplified. In addition to proclaiming the monarchy as anointed by God, and a, and a mediator to the heavenly church, the gallery of kings declares the English king to be God's earthly surrogate, a message particularly significant during the years of war. The war with France was a subject matter of great concern to all divisions of society, since it had affected, to some extent, the entire English population. 
The core of Edward III's alterca altercations with, the Fran with France laid in his hereditary rights, which were challenged by Philip VI, the King of France. Accordingly, Edward's dy dynastic and authoritative power were of central concern and were continuously demonstrated by rhetoric and image as indisputable. <coughs> to contemporary viewers familiar with the frame of reference, Lincoln's powerful image of kingship would have had a heightened political connotation. Demonstrating Edward III's irrevocable hereditary right to Normandy as the successor of William the Conqueror. In addition to providing a visual propaganda, the Gallery of Kings functioned as a constant spectacle for its 14th century viewer and assured the monarchy's visual attendance. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I did that wrong. No, I did not. This is, this is my conclusion, so it's okay. <laughs> In addition to providing a visual propaganda, the Gallery of Kings functions function as a constant spectacle for its 14th century viewer and assured the monarchy's virtual attendance in any future event that took place in front of Lincoln's Cathedral. The Gallery of Kings, located above the central doorway of the West Facade, further elevated the monarch as the subject of adoration during religious ceremonies. And in effect, the gathered community would direct its prayer and devotion to the image of the ruler, who would have appeared as God's earthly replacement and a divine defender of the church. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Right. Thank you. Um, we have a little while for questions, if people have questions. I have questions. <laughs> Yes, you can find actual small residues of paint, um, specifically in places that are not so much exposed, so like, like really like folded behind the ear or like in one of the folds of the garment. So you can actually be pretty certain that they were painted, but how they were painted, I don't know. I would like to think that the quartered shield was sort of painted on one of the figures, but that is just my, my fancy, I guess. Um. Right. So I just I would like to find sort of. Okay. So w there's no evidence for sculpture actually being ordered for the facade. Okay. And so when you look at the, the yeah, there. there's nothing to, to to point that there was anything. And also looking at the at the niches, there's no there's no nothing to sort of suggest that something was there and was perhaps broken off. But what is interesting is that it does have like it sort of has a feeling that someone maybe intended for there to be something placed because because they are deep enough. But there's nothing to point to anything that was ordered or. Are you talking about inside the cathedral? That that inside the church, church sorry. Yes, yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, so I mean, comparing that and sort of trying to figure out what the Gallery of Kings would have been painted or yeah. how it would yeah. could be interesting, yeah. Thank you. So we do know for certain that will I find a better wait? The Norman frieze, oh sorry about this, the Norman frieze was definitely painted. And we do know the Gallery of Kings was painted. 
So that would give us, aha, uh -huh, no, we're back to the same one. There we go. So that would give us like a strip right here at the curve and a down at the um, But whether anything else is painted, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, even the, the colonnettes with the, the sort of carving, I'm not quite sure if they were painted or not. Could you say a little bit more about that possible later date in the 1380s as opposed to the 1360s? I was just thinking that there are obviously lots of good reasons for thinking that this is the 1360s. But in political terms, it seems slightly odd simply if we're thinking about this in relation to languages war and then you're going through an extended period of truce with France post the Treaty of Bettini and that sort of thing. Whether, in some ways, politically, a slightly later date might work. I actually thought, this is my theory, that actually during the time of truce, it would be the ultimate time to, to display something like this, because sort of showing that Edward did not give up his claim, that he's still the, the magnificent king, like the, the warrior king, and, and, and nothing that the treaty with Brittany did not really change that. And also, if we sort of push it to the later 1360s, there's sort of hints that, of like that we... If you go to late, yeah. Yeah, if we go to late 1360s, yeah, yeah. so that's sort of trying to, we're trying to get like more discussion about re-engaging in war. Um, the only problem I have with the later date of the 1380s or 90s is that Richard II would have been king. Mm -hmm. And he actually visited Lincoln in 1387. And it, like sort of excluding him from that from that, the, that gallery seems a bit awkward. So either, I mean, they could have added, a, it would be difficult to add a figure after, after having all that, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be all that easy, but um, sort of, it's, it's sort of weird to have 11 figures when you could have had 12 and, yeah. Judgment watch is the judgment story is front and center on the one. Which one? Wait a minute. Did I go back? Go back? Go back? No, that's not. Uh, wait a minute. For, oh, it doesn't matter. On, on the main, the main um, yeah. front elevation, you have the judgment story. You have a thing it's, it's on the side. On the side. It is. It is on the side. Um, exactly. And and it's not just that because why do I have so many slides? Okay, so this is not really it. This is the, the last judgment. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why Lincoln have sort of put it around the side rather than that the front? No, I, so if the judgment porch was placed there in the 13th century, at that time it could be that the West Front actually still had its Norman sculpture. So it would have the tree of Jesse, Christ in majesty, and, and, it could, and the judgment porch was also built specifically for the choir of St. Hugh. So it's a different purpose, and also the iconography is completely, <coughs> almost as if, almost messed up. Because <laughs> here you, you really have at the center Christ, Christ in, in judgment, left, bad, right, yep. good, and sort of really straightforward design. And at Lincoln, it's the judgment porch is, is in the wrong place, not sure what they had on the west front, it's sort of a guessing game. Is that part of perhaps because What do you mean about that? Well, in the sense, the, the West Door you know, is part of the original position. Yes, later, that's and sort of, and yeah. That's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, and these people's arms. Yeah, and, but it was changed anyway by Bishop Alexander um, later in the, in the 12th century. Um, but it, it could, the earthquake was actually in the later 12th century, right? Am I getting that right? 11, 1180 something. So that would have been after Bishop Alexander placed up his, his his statues, and it could be that they were damaged. I um, mean, well, they certainly look damaged today, but that's for different reasons. Yeah. If not, will you join with me in thanking Lester for?